I'm James Randi, and tonight we're going to meet some people who claim to be able to heal the sick with psychic powers. Many people have heard of the psychic surgeons of the Philippines. Reverend Roger Crothwaite, You've recently come back from the Philippines. Tell us, what did you see there? Well, yes, James, I've um, seen many uh, psychic surgeons in the Philippines. And as a magician, some, I believe, are, and appear to me to be genuine, and some appear to me to be uh, fake and using sleight of hand. We have some film here of what they do. Now, I must warn you, ladies and gentlemen, some of the material we have to show you can be very disturbing and may upset some of our viewers. Despite having been exposed as sleight of hand over 15 years ago, what you are seeing here continues to be believed throughout the world as genuine surgery. There are several hundred healers and psychic surgeons operating in the Philippines, and their business is interwoven with the Filipino economy. The psychic surgery is normally only a small part of the scheme for taking money from the desperate. Most customers are foreigners who boost the economy with their payments for travel, accommodation, and ancillary treatments. Now you've seen for yourself, but is this a trick or do they have supernatural powers? I'm going to show you a trick which uses methods well known to conjurers. You may or may not be able to see any difference between what is claimed to be genuine psychic surgery and this bit of sleight of hand. All right, the patient is on the table. We simply bear the midriff. Keep your arms down to your side, just to protect your clothing. A bit of towel. It's all over. The mess is simply mopped up, and the patient is none the worse for the operation having taken place. You feeling better now? Wait till you get the bill. <laughs> As always, it's for you to consider the evidence and make up your own mind. In our search for healers who would discuss their work with us, we met Mr. Stephen Turoff. Recently, we visited him at his home in Essex, where in the course of his working day, he sees at least 20 patients. I'm a carpenter. I'm a carpenter and joiner. <laughs> right. And I know nothing, I can swear to you, I know nothing about the medical profession. Right. It started about 18, 19 years ago. To cut a long story short, started to develop the gift that I had, and this gift turned out to be healing. With what I do is a bit different, obviously. I mean, you're talking about doing things that the medical profession can't do. Uh, Dr. Khan himself started to, um, on July, uh, July the 10th, I think, 1985, was the first time he came through. I have done thousands of these operations, or Dr. Khan has done thousands of these operations. We've never lost anyone yet. <laughs> Dr. Khan would tell you, you can get no infection from what he does. He can cut you open with a rusty knife and there would be no infection. Good day to you. I need to introduce myself, I am Dr. Khan, Yosef Khan. Dr. Khan, do you mind if we film you today? No. I do not mind. 
I want to do a little work on here today. All I'm going to do is just to go in here. I have a small decision here. There will be no pain. I have not given an injection. We have had people here who have had uh, cancer and I've cured them immediately. I've had people here with back problems and we've had to see them two or three times. Is there any pain? Yeah. What we're we going to do is to do this now. Just to draw out a little bit of negative energy. Yeah, good light, please. I'm sorry for your camera, but I do need to cover this up. There is a reason for it. You see what is happening? The, it's coming out of her. So she, she will start to shake. That is out. There's the clock. And you see, the opening is closed. It's gone. Healing has always been there. Since time immemorial. But I tell you this, there is nothing for anybody to lose to see a healer. Some may go away with the pain they come with, but ah, uh, the spirit has been touched. What I'm going to do first is to give you a small injection here. These you do not see, they are called etheric injections. Good, just breathe through the mouth. You must remember people that come to me are people that um, your hospital can do no more for. It was not so bad. Hmm? We are able to do this because of the power that we use and bring with us. Hmm? So you must not go sticking instruments up your nose or other people's noses. <laughs> Turoff, do you have any evidence at all that there ever was an actual living Dr. Khan whose spirit, you say, visits you? None at all. Well, the medical procedures we've seen on this bit of tape here are a medieval practice known as wet cupping. It's uh, quite obsolete now. It was thought at one time to be useful and is now known to be totally useless. The other process seems to consist of sticking clamps all the way into a man's nasal cavities. Why do you do this sort of thing? What does it accomplish? I... As Stephen Chuhoff, don't do it. Dr. Khan does it. You are the one who collects the money and you are paid for this service, is that correct? Correct. Well, we have Dr. Natalie MacDonald with us. Uh, Natalie is the secretary to the British Medical Association's Medical Ethics Community. I believe you have some questions that you'd like to ask uh, Mr. Turoff. I was very disturbed that on the film you said that you cured cancer immediately. And I would be concerned that vulnerable people who may have cancer may come to you, may delay seeking orthodox medical treatment, which might be curative, and thereby might forego their chance of being cured of cancer. I'd like to state, people come to me after they've been to a doctor, after they've been to the hospital, where the doctor and the hospital can do no more for them. They can offer them basic no hope. 
Secondly, yes, cures have happened. And presumably you then you have the, the medical evidence that they had cancer to There's, start with. Oh, yeah. There's one chap and he was told by a consultant that he had a tumour on the spine. Incurable, could not operate, given so long to live. I can't. Oh, let me finish, you've had to say. Dr. Calm came through, operated on him, worked on him. The man felt immediate improvement, immediate. Now, the very next day, and this is testified to, the very next day, he had to go to the hospital for his appointment. The consultant checked him and called, as I understand it, for further tests on the man. When they done the test, the tumour was gone. I haven't seen that evidence. No, because they've not showed you it. In this day and age, we're all very concerned about the transmission of infections, everything from hepatitis to HIV disease. And I was very concerned to see that you, were, you weren't wearing gloves, you didn't sterilise your instruments, and that you might possibly transmit infection from yourself to patients, from one patient to another. When Dr. Khan speaks, he would tell you that you cannot get any infection from what he does. It can cut you open with a rusty knife. Yes, but I'm concerned about people who might be vulnerable. You say that the patients you treat are people who are at the end of, end of their tether. Mm -hmm. People like that can be very open to influence, and I would be concerned about the risk of infection. I also would like to know the scientific rationale, if there is any, for putting a pair of scissors up somebody's nose into the nasopharynx. Well, let's put it this way. Rational looking at psychic surgery or any form of the paranormal, you can always say rational. Some diseases can be exceedingly difficult di to diagnose. I would, I would suspect your powers of of diagnosis, there may be things that people will come to you with that you, you cannot diagnose and they will indeed delay seeing their doctor. I certainly don't diagnose. I have no medical understanding whatsoever. The good doctor that controls me, that takes me over, he diagnoses. He will do what he can to help that individual with, I must state, outstanding success. We have a Another guest in our audience today, among many, Professor Margot Brazier is with the Faculty of Law at Manchester University. Uh, Margot, perhaps you could share with us what legal questions you think that these practices might raise. Well, the first question, of course, is can anybody who likes practice medicine? And the answer actually is yes. The Medical Act makes it an offence to pretend to be a registered medical practitioner, but it's not actually a criminal offence in England to practice medicine with no qualifications at all. Is there any, uh, any cause for believing that assault might be committed in these operations? Even if it's only a, a tiny wound, a tiny cut, that is an assault. And the consent of the victim is immaterial unless it's one of the recognized exceptions that the law permits and sanctions. Now, this includes reasonable surgical interference. If there ever was a court case, the question would be whether the court considered psychic surgery mm -hmm. to be reasonable surgical interference. What about adults? who should have the, the good common sense to know whether they go to a man like Mr. Turoff or not. But what about their children? If they take their children in there, are they to blame at that point if something goes wrong? They might well find themselves to blame. Parents have a duty to ensure that their children obtain adequate medical care when it's necessary. Well, we have a Mrs. McMillan in the audience this evening. And uh, Mrs. McMillan, I believe that you take your 14-year-old son regularly to see Turoff rather than your GP. What do you think, uh, having just heard the legal situation from Margot, does that change your attitude at all? No, not at all. I'd always take my son to see him. You'll continue to take your I son to I will do him. so, yes. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I have a son who's <coughs> almost 33 years old, and since birth he has suffered from cerebral palsy and has had uh, incoordination of his limbs. Uh, almost a year ago, I took him to uh, Mr. Turoff and... Uh, he had surgery from Dr. Khan, and he, has, he is perfectly well now. He asked me to come on his behalf tonight to speak and say that he is perfectly fit. I have seen many cases of healing. What goes on isn't magic. Sometimes 
All that's happened is that the healer has given the person the permission to get better. And the, and the person didn't have the permission before because of the whole family set up. Sometimes the person has wanted to change, but needed some kind of push. It's been a very, very temporary healing. I've seen plenty of people get up from their bed of pain and walk, but only for a day or two. And the healer wasn't there to check up a day or two later. No one can be all things to all people. I could be mystically employed if I so desired. But uh, as a working man, I have to see not 20 people a day, but 60 or more a day. Yes, ma'am. It's time now that we, in, we conducted a proper scientific study. And it's made impossible by the prejudice of people who believe that it's dangerous or that one's abusing people who are very vulnerable because they're afraid of dying. I, I don't disagree with any of those points. But what you all may be missing is that if, in fact, as I believe, Healing has something very genuine to offer humanity. It will alleviate suffering. I'm sure it saves lives in some cases. I'm prepared to offer my services to any casualty department in the land if you can find one with the guts to take me up on my offer and watch me work. My work is not intrusive. I work with people outside of the body, about two and a half inches off the body. I don't particularly understand what's happening, but I do know that it works. There are experiments going on at the moment that have been organized through the BMA so that certain uh, illnesses that uh, they have said uh, can only be remedied by surgery have been given to various healers. We don't know what the results are, but there's no doubt that it has been looked into. It's unfortunate that we've received just recently a couple of patients from Mr. Turoff there, <clears throat> one with a back problem and one with a cancer problem. And um, I quite frankly would have liked to have had a word with him before the program started. What would you have said to him? I would have said that um, two of his patients had come to us with a problem uh, which he purportedly had got rid of, but it was still there. I cannot cure everybody I see. I don't pretend to cure everybody I see. I say to anybody that comes to me, I will do what I can to help you. I think that we're seeing here a wonderful attempt at having power without responsibility. You want to be a very powerful person. You're demonstrating a great deal of power there. And at the same time, you're saying, I am not responsible for what I do. Let me tell you about a research group called the Inner Mind Foundation. Recently at the Portchester Halls in London, they held a symposium on psychic surgery for hundreds of people. Committees of bishops, doctors, and magicians attended, but the media were deliberately excluded. Father Crossway, uh, you are the chairman of the Inner Mind Foundation. How many psychic surgeons performed at that symposium? There were two. Two of them, and two what surgeons. did they do? Uh, one of them uh, made an apparently, he claimed, a paranormal incision and uh, attempted to remove the uh, tissue from inside the body. And the other, uh, in fact, didn't perform any so-called psychic surgery, um, merely manipulated and uh, uh, laid hands on the patients. We have seen right beside you, Professor, uh, Pro Professor Arthur Ellison. Pardon me, Professor. Uh, you were the scientific advisor to this symposium on psychic surgery, and you're also the an officer of the Society for Psychical Research. I understand. I looked very carefully, indeed, with an open mind. Uh, and I could see uh, what I would call normal uh, explanations for what was uh, ostensibly uh, paranormal. It seems to me that uh, the most interesting part of that conference will be the follow-up reports. Uh, tell me, in cases where the body was actually cut, there was an incision made, do you know if there are any precautions against any kind of infection? When we saw this, uh, this making of an incision, uh, the patient's blood was involved. There was no washing of hands, no anything. Um, I got very worried indeed, and so did the doctors. James, once we realized what was happening, we stopped that procedure immediately. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, he made an incision a bit like Stevens. 
uh, except that there was, seemed to be a little sleight of hand involved. But he didn't claim that it was paranormal. He said nothing about it. He just did it. Father Crosswaite, you are an accomplished sleight of hand person, incidentally, I must add. Yes. And I believe a member of the Magic Circle? Yes, I am. I see. Yes. And what, what was your opinion of it? Uh, my opinion of La Porga uh, was that uh, there was nothing paranormal that was happening. Uh, my opinion of the other psychic surgeon, having seen that surgeon operate in the Philippines, I was amazed and astounded. Yeah. How many people here by a show of hands would not go to see Stephen Turoff? I see. Sir, perhaps you would tell me, why would you not go to see Stephen Turoff? I just don't believe it at all. Well, I've heard so far. What makes it unbelievable to you? It's just the way that the people are so convinced. Like the lady down there, they're going really over the top to try and say, oh, it's so good, it's so good. Would you go for, to a psychic surgeon or would you go for orthodox medicine? I don't think I would say, go to a psychic say surgeon. Say orthodox medicine. Let me medicine. answer you. You've asked me a question. Yes, you I'll haven't ask, stopped I'll ask talking you another for a moment. Ma'am, would you let me answer your question, please? No, I wouldn't go to a psychic surgeon. Now. What about one day when you were very ill, hospitals gave you up? You just, you wouldn't go anywhere else for alternative medicine? No, I don't think I would. That's my well, that's, personal that's choice, though, is it good. not? I'm glad to hear that. You're glad to hear yes, that? Yes, I am. Uh, who are you, ma'am? Would you identify yourself? I will identify myself, yes. I happen to be Stephen Chiroff's wife. And I what think. I have witnessed at home... <laughs> that... Your question. Yes, I'd like to ask Stephen, um, as he's so interested and, and obviously very concerned about people who are ill, why he doesn't go and get some medical knowledge so that in his real self he can perhaps have some understanding of Dr. Khan's work and of the work of the doctors who he's offering himself as an alternative to. And then what would happen? You would say, okay, you've got a little bit of medical knowledge. That is where you could be getting your answers from. <coughs> no. I'd rather stay in Eden. So it's to defend your reputation, then, so that you can carry on earning You know, money. my reputation, I don't have to defend it. You know, you say earlier on about, I take payment. Yeah, I've got a mortgage, the same as some of you people. I need clothes, the same as you. I like to have a holiday, the same as you people. You know, I've got overheads, the same as you people. Of course, it's got to be paid for. But you know, I see many people for free. What I'm saying, it doesn't matter tonight what you say about me. At the end of the day, I am curing people. The it doesn't matter what you say. All the people that do this healing can heal. There's no question about that. They, they prove beyond doubt, and so has uh, uh, Stephen, proved his powers of healing. I think it's very dangerous and misleading nonsense. And uh, we, we were asked earlier about why orthodox medicine hadn't gone in and tested this kind of stuff. By many healers' definitions, a proper scientist is somebody whose mind so, is so open that his brains have already fallen out. <laughs> that is, that he already believes in the paranormal, and the scientists that they accept are general, generally the fringe end of the scientific spectrum. Arthur Ellison, you say you found sleight of hand with a Filipino surgeon. Stephen Turoff, you say you're for real. Your kind of treatment is not tested or controlled by any publicly accountable body. Ladies and gentlemen, is that good enough for you? I'm James Randi. Good night.